Thanks so much, Laura. Uh, do keep Bibles open. Uh, we're going to be spending some time in that passage together. I was actually having a conversation with Joel not so long ago about, uh, we, um, I've got a friend who, who works at the site of where they gather, at where the martyrs, three million, uh, three million um, people come and gather once a year at the martyrs memorial, and we were talking about this. And um, Joel was telling me about some de- lots of details of the story that I hadn't known. I thought it'd be so good to share with all of us. And as we look at this passage together, you'll see there's lots of correspondences. I thought this was a great week to talk about both, you know, widespread conversion and also the place of um, persecution and how that aids the gospel. And it did in, in his history as well. Um, so with that uh, in mind, let's look at these verses. We're thinking today at the... Um, this question, um, uh, how are Christians to live in a world that doesn't share their outlook? Um, and one of the striking features, I think, of living at this moment in history is just, um, it's very obvious, isn't it, that each generation's experience of life is radically different from the one before. So, for example, for my parents, um, they were born in the days before TVs. And for my children, they cannot understand a world before smartphones. And just in that short, you know, two generations, there's been this radical shift. But in, in addition to technological shifts, there's been some pretty major uh, cultural and ideological shifts across the same period, uh, especially in this country. Uh, one of the differences for Christians, at least, of living uh, when we do today in London compared to two generations ago is that there's no longer a kind of shared language. There's no longer a shared understanding of how the world is. Um, I was talking to my parents about this. Um, Back in Billy Graham's day, Billy Graham was a famous 20th century evangelist. Um, He would just go up to people, uh, say, in London and say, you know how we all believe in God? And everyone would nod. Uh, And you know how you really struggle to keep his standards? And everyone would nod. And then Billy Graham would say, oh, well, don't worry, because Jesus is the answer that you need. And then he'd have, actually, this weekend is a a great um, anniversary. 70 years ago, he had a great um, uh, mission in London with lots of fruit. Um, It's not like that today. In fact, if you go up to someone and say, you know how we all believe in God in London, most people will just look quizzically at you and say, "What, what do you mean? What God? You might believe in God, but I don't, or I believe in a different God. And if you say, yeah, but you know how we all have these standards that God's given us, and they'll, again, just say, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Whose standards? Why do you say they're our standards, etc.? cetera? Um, but it's not just that our shared assumptions and language have gone, um, but I think also how Christians are perceived by those around them has shifted as well. Um, there's a recent book I came across um, by an Australian pastor. He's called Stephen McAlpine, and his book is called being the bad guys, how to live for Jesus in a world that says you shouldn't. And he's trying to help the church think through and adapt to a culture where, in at least in some places, uh, Christians have gone from being perceived as irrelevant uh, as now being hateful in, in some contexts. Um, thankfully, we are not the first um, generation to hit some of these challenges. And of course, the Bible has loads of wisdom for us. And we've been tracking through um, this book of Acts, and we've been following what happens on the Apostle Paul's first missionary trip around the Mediterranean. And up until now, and and you'll know this if you've been with us for this series, he's been going to non-Jewish, that is Gentile cities. But wherever he goes, he goes first to the synagogue. And he speaks to the Jewish people and to the God-fearing Gentiles, basically the people who all already believe the Bible. And today is the first time, and we're looking at Paul's experience in Lystra, where that is different. And he goes to this very rural, this very pagan place. There isn't a synagogue where he goes, and they literally speak a different language. And that's going to be relevant when we come to the text in a minute. And I think this is a great passage for us to learn and to um, see this model of what Christian mission looks like when it lands in a completely foreign environment, culturally speaking. And the first thing this passage underlines for us is that Jesus is committed to reaching those 
who are far off. Um, If you were with us last week, we saw in in verse 3 that Jesus backed up the preaching of the gospel. It said, by granting signs and wonders to be done by the apostles. And we get exactly the same thing here in Lystra. Look at verse 8. Now, at Lystra, there was a man sitting there who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. Um, I put a slide up there, but actually, unlike the guy in the picture who who clearly can limp on crutches, the the guy in the story, he had never walked. So he had no musculature at all in his legs. And it says, verse 9, he listened to Paul speaking And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and he began walking. Just immediate, you know, no physio, nothing. He just, off he goes. And this miracle is clear evidence that Jesus is fully behind Paul and his mission of taking the gospel to these unreached pagan peoples. Actually, if, we've been, uh, if you've been reading through the whole book of Acts, and we have been doing this series for a long time in, in fits and starts, but um, there's a deliberate echo of a previous passage where not Paul, but Peter does something very similar. And he's, a, a man is told to rise up and walk, and he does so. And you might say, so what? You know, does that matter that they just happen to do similar miracles? But actually, if you look closely, it's not just the type of miracle um, that is the same in these two passages, the one in chapter 3 and the one in chapter 14, but also loads and loads of the details of the passage are the same. So in each of them, it's the first miracle that we're told about in the first case of of Peter and then of Paul. Uh, In both cases, the man is lame from birth. We're told that detail. In both of them, Peter or Paul looks intently at him. And that is a strange detail to include. In both of them, the man shows faith. In both of them, the layman leaps, which again, is an unusual detail. And in both of them, there is confusion about whose power it is that provides the healing. And back in chapter 3, verse 12, Peter immediately begins his speech. This is in Jerusalem. And he says, men of Israel... Why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made this man walk? It's Jesus' name which has made this man strong. And it's the same in our passage today. They assume it's Paul and Barnabas and their power in verse 11 that has done the healing. And therefore they assume, as we're going to see, that, you know, these Greek gods have come down to earth. Um, So there's all these similarities and we're thinking, so what? There's this deliberate echo of Peter's ministry, but there's a particular reason. And the reason is so that we get the point that just as Jesus was committed to reaching his own people, the Jewish people, through Peter and through Peter's ministry all across the first half of the book of Acts, so now we're seeing that Jesus is just as committed to reaching these idolatrous pagan Gentiles. But this time through Paul, and through his ministry in the second half of Acts. So we've got this echo, and it tells us this crucial point. And I think it's something that we often need reminding of. I I wonder if we actually believe this. Jesus is not just interested in reaching nice church people. Actually, the sort of people that Peter was focused on. Those people who are in the right family and have the right heritage, those people who have the Bible as their starting point. Now, what we see here is Jesus is just as passionate about reaching the unlikely and the outsiders, that the pe- kinds of people that Paul was going to reach, those who are uh, immersed in a completely different world, a different ido- ideology, and uh, perhaps who know nothing about the true God. And I guess the first thing we're to remember as we navigate this question, you know, how are we to live in a world that, um, you know, surrounded by people who don't share our outlook? um, The the first thing is we naturally feel intimidated, I think. You know, we can want uh, lots of churches, they just batten down the hatches, they pull up the drawbridge, they retreat into my safe group of friends, my safe hobbies. And yet here we see that 
these people who feel so distant and alien and far off, these are the very people Jesus loves. Uh, These are the ones he laid down his life for. Uh, These are the ones he's committed to reaching uh, with his gospel. And the message for us is that we're not to be discouraged and we're not to be discriminatory. We're not to say, oh yeah, that you're in and you're out. No, no one is safe from Jesus' love. It can flare up anywhere. Uh, he, he has a heart for all different people groups. So that's the first thing. But the next thing we see is that the challenges and the language may vary, but the invitation's the same even when we're going to very different types of groups. Let's get back into the passage. And the first thing we discover is that the challenges that Paul and Barnabas encounter here in Lystra are unlike anything they've seen before. Look at verse 11. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in Iconian, this language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. I guess the first thing we're struck by when we read this is that signs and wonders alone are just not enough, are they? These people cannot deny that there has been a powerful and public miracle. Uh, Like all the miracles in Luke and in Acts, it is undeniable. No one can dispute it. But their first instinct, understandably, is to try and interpret what has happened within their existing framework. Of course they do. That's what anyone would do. And in some ways, as we've seen, their, their misunderstanding is not very different to the one that Peter encountered when he did a miracle back in Jerusalem in chapter three. You know, men of Israel, why do you stare at us? as though it's by our own power that he's healed. Only this time, what's different is because um, Paul and Barnabas don't understand the language, they don't know Lyconian, it actually takes a lot longer before they realize what's going on and before they can correct this misunderstanding. And so the whole thing kind of gets out of control. Um, um, When we're in the last chapter, chapter 13, if you're with us, I, I suggested that... Uh, when Paul had that encounter with the proconsul Sergius Paulus and his snakish advisor Elimas, if you remember that passage, um, that story may have been, I suggest, what inspired Tolkien's story of King Theoden and his snakish advisor Wormtongue. Uh, it's quite bright in here, but you can just see the outline of that. Um, I'm, I'm less sure about this one, but it's possible. <laughs> that this episode in chapter 14 may have been part of the inspiration behind George Lucas's story in Return of the Jedi. Lots of us will know that film and about how the Ewoks mistakenly, they see this this robot, C-3PO, and they think he's a god, and they decide to offer sacrifices and worship him. Now, if you know the film, it's quite comic, and this, this robot enjoys it, and he loves being treated like a god. But that is not what happens here. Barnabas and Paul feel quite differently. Look at verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and they rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. It's interesting, these guys, Paul and Barnabas, they can tolerate all kinds of things. They can tolerate even persecution. What they cannot tolerate is receiving in themselves the glory that belongs to the only God. We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news. We're going to think quite a lot about that phrase, good news. We bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things, these empty things, to and the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. And the thing I want to underline first is not only um, is the response of these crowds different from what Paul and Barnabas are used to, but also the language, the way they express the gospel message is also adapted to their situation. I think it's something that's useful for us to notice. 
we end up in all kinds of different situations, talking to different types of people in London. You see, when Paul is speaking in the synagogue, the starting point is always a reading from the Scriptures. And he, they have a reading from the Old Testament Scriptures. And then Paul uh, takes us to how Jesus is the one who was promised in the Scriptures. That's his uh, pattern. But here, of course... Not only do these people, these Lystrans, know nothing about the Jewish scriptures. They don't even know that there is one creator God. And so Paul has to have a different approach. And he goes back a stage and he explains that there is a creator. Uh, There's a creator who made them for relationship with himself. And that even though they have turned away from him, they've turned to vain idols. Wonderfully, he says, this creator God is inviting us to come back to him, verse 15. And then in verse 16, Paul describes how in past generations, God allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Actually, this is part of God's judgment on idolatry, is that he hands people over to the effects of their rebellion. You you want to worship other things? Well, let's see how that goes for you. Uh, But even during this time when God did that, he was showing... um, kindness to them. Actually, he's, he's getting ready for a pivot, I think. So in past generations, verse 16, suggests that Paul's about to explain that now, in the coming of Jesus, it's, it's time to repent. He actually does that move when he does a similar sermon in chapter 17. In the past, this, but now that Jesus has come, this. But before he does that pivot, he says, verse 17, Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So Paul is saying here that this God who has justly handed you over to experience the effects of your idolatry for a time, even during this time, he was showing you undeserved kindness. He was giving you prosperity and joy. Uh, He was giving you every good thing that you enjoy at his hand. And therefore, this call to return to the Lord is a call to return to the one who loves you, to return to the one who's provided for you every good gift you've ever known. And so actually, in coming back to him, you're just returning to the one who's always been there for you, the one who has always been the true source of your life and your blessings. Come back to him. Uh, There's obviously more Paul could say, but they're a tough crowd. And I don't think he ends his sermon where he wants to. And then verse 18 tells us, even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. Now, the thing to notice in this presentation is that in a very different context, Paul models for us how to adapt his language, but in a way so that he can still show them their same need of the gospel and he gives them the same invitation to return to the Lord. And this description that he uses of sin, he doesn't use the normal way of talking of law breaking. They don't even know that there is a law of God given through Moses. He instead uses the the language of idolatry. This is a very biblical, a very penetrating way of engaging with people who don't yet know the Bible. Of course, there's a a kind of literal, physical idolatry, which these Lystrans were practicing. You know, they were um, bowing down to, to, to statues and so on. But actually, the Bible has a very nuanced view of idolatry, that whether we bow down to physical idols or not, all of us are prone to having idols of the heart. Actually, if you've been with us in our Bible overview, we've been noticing this, for example, when we did our study in 1 Samuel 8. And the Bible teaches that there is no neutral life. Uh, The Bible says everybody, all human beings live for something. There's always something which is our main focus, where we find significance, where we find value. There's something that we turn to for security or for satisfaction as we try and navigate life's difficulties. And usually it's going to be a very good thing. But the problem is that we make that into a God thing. We, we take something created and we put it in the place in our lives that the creator should have. Um, some of us 
you may know this guy, the atheist David Foster Wallace. He's the guy that the Guardian described as the most brilliant American writer of his generation. Uh, he, he died um, not long ago. Before he died, he gave a, a graduation address, and he said this. I'm going to put the, the quote up. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Um, you can imagine his words weren't well received in the atheistic community he was part of. He's basically expressing the biblical teaching that I was describing. Everybody lives for something. And then he goes on in his speech to say this. An outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, then you'll never have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you'll die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power. You'll feel weak and afraid, and you'll need ever more power over others to keep fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart. You'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. And here in our passage, in verse 16, Paul says, We bring you good news, that you should turn from these things to a living God. And I think Wallace does a brilliant job. He's not speaking as a Christian, but even so, he does a brilliant job at describing why worshipping anything but the living God is always going to be enslaving. And therefore, why it really is good news, the best ever news that we can return to worship the true God. And we were hearing about some of the changes in the kingdom of Buganda, and you'll be able to know from your own heritage and perhaps from your own experience that the, the freedom that comes from turning from idols. Uh, I don't know that Wallace made that step himself, but he could see it very clearly. And actually, I have to say this has been very true in my own life. Maybe you know this in your life. Uh, I know about the enslavement of idols and the freedom um, that comes from worshipping the true God. Uh, this is my experience growing up. I was um, at school, at least. I was very driven. Um, I was obsessed with um, getting the right grades, being in the right sports teams, getting the right prizes, uh, getting approval from the right people. And uh, it was exhausting. Um, it was like drinking salt water. Uh, it would never be enough. It was always a, a new challenge. I was always going after the next one and the next one. I would never have described it as an idol. I wouldn't have known that language. Uh, but looking back, it was definitely an idol that I was worshipping. And therefore, it really was good news. That's what it's called uh, in 15. When I heard uh, this wonderful uh, discovery that Jesus had done everything necessary for me to receive the only well done that actually matters. You know, far more important than any examiner or admissions tutor. There is one well done which has eternal benefit. And I, I discovered that there is an acceptance which God provided for me in Christ, which wasn't fragile. Everything else in my life was vulnerable. You know, if, if I was only as good as my last uh, test. But there was a well done which couldn't be snatched. And actually discovering that made a huge impact on me, brought a, a new freedom into my life. Because the point is that idols always lie to us. Uh, they never deliver on what they promise. And actually, when you fail them, they will punish you and they will leave you crushed. And the good news is that when we worship the true God, he really does satisfy. He is the one by whom and for whom we were made. And when we fail him, he dies for us and forgives us. And all of this is behind this statement, why tr turning to the true and living God is good news for everyone in the world. So we had this question, how are we to live in a world that doesn't share our outlook? And I guess first we're to remember point one, uh, we're not, you know, 
Jesus wants to reach those who are far off. We're not to disqualify them. We saw in point two that though the, the challenges and the language may be uh, different here and there, the invitation is always the same. But as we close, just this final point, this final perspective, that Jesus' mission is advanced through limping. And I understand I'm going to have to unpack what that means, but let's look at it. Um, There's actually a chance that up to verse 19, this passage might have led us to a kind of triumphalist view of Christian mission. You know, learn these strategies and you can't go wrong. But let's listen in to what happens next in verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. I put up this slide um, from a modern staining in Somalia just to give us a sense of the, the horrific brutality of what was happening here. And then verse 20, but when the disciples gathered about him, I guess, you know, they were going to carry his body away to burial. When they gathered around him, he rose up and he entered the city, the same city where he had just been lynched. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Now, in each of the previous locations, we've been plotting all the places Paul stops. In Paphos and in Antioch and in Iconium, Luke always gives us an encouraging progress report of who has believed the message. Nothing like that happens here. In fact, it seems like all that Paul leaves behind him is just a trail of blood. And then off he limps 20 miles to the next place, Derby. Presumably, I, I imagine it was like this, you know, with someone each side to support him. He actually says in, in Galatians 6, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And we, we assume he was never the same again. He always had the legacy of this attack. And the question the passage then raises is this. Is Paul a success or a failure here in Lystra? How would you answer that question? You see, at the beginning of the passage, you know, it begins. We see this obvious display of power. We see a dramatic healing. And then at the end of the passage, we just get this terrible weakness. And we just see a limping missionary with a trail of blood off behind him. And yet, and yet Luke has been training us throughout this book of Acts to see this with different eyes and to see suffering for Christ, not as defeat, but as victory. Uh, think of the passage we actually looked at, if you're with us on Wednesday night at our vision evening. And um, Stephen memorably got stoned to death. And that even as that happens, we, we discovered he was walking in Jesus' footsteps. Father, forgive him, forgive them, as he's able to say just what Jesus said on the cross. And as he dies, Jesus appears to him in a vision to encourage him. Well done, welcome home. And in fact, when, when Jesus called Saul in chapter 9, Jesus declared that he would show Paul how much he must suffer for the sake of Jesus' name. And actually, it's Paul's willingness to suffer which again and again underlines the credibility, the truth of his message. And actually, it's the same for us today. I think very often we think it's, you know, we bring credibility to Jesus and his mission by showing how strong and impressive we might be. Look at all these cool, these influential people who believe it. Look how well organized and impressive our events are, whatever it is. And of course, that's the, the, the normal recruitment method, isn't it, for companies and organizations in London? Sign up with us. Uh, we'll help you get ahead in life. And of course, when we play that same strategy, the world's games, we look like every other organization, every other movement, trying our own cheesy recruitment drive. Jesus calls us to a different approach. He calls us to live in ways that make no sense unless the gospel's true. Being weak, facing rejection. Uh, these things are not bugs, they are features in Jesus' kingdom. So when uh, the teenager stands up in assembly and talks about their faith and their knees are knocking and their voice is trembling, uh, that doesn't undermine their credibility, it boosts it. Or, or when we dare to 
mentioned Jesus in a conversation with a friend and we know that gear change and it's awkward. Uh, People realize in that moment that we're not doing it for popularity. We're not doing it for extra likes. There must be another reason. It's because of a truth reason. And that changes the dynamic and it honors Jesus and it brings a witness to the truth. Um, Oswald Sanders, um, he ran the missionary organization OMF in the last century, and he used to tell a story about an Indian evangelist um, who was a new convert and he was on fire for the Lord and used to travel vast distances to try and tell people about Jesus. On one occasion, he'd traveled the whole day, he'd walked a difficult journey to a new village. And he was arming and ahhing because it was near the end of the day, whether he was going to go in and you know, start speaking about Jesus in the town square. And he had a go. He thought he'd give it a go. And it went very badly. Uh, people just didn't get it. And they started laughing and they mocked him. And he, so he just gave up. And he, he left the village, tail between his legs, discouraged, actually exhausted. And he just lay down under a tree outside uh, the village just to have some rest and to go to sleep. Um, and as nightfall came close, He suddenly woke up and he was surrounded by what seemed like the whole village. And he thought this was it. He thought his time was up and he was about to get beaten to death. Uh, But just uh, as he thought that was going to happen, the elder of the village said to him, we came out to see you. And then we noticed how bloody your feet are as you slept. And we've decided you must be a holy man and that you care about us. Because you came so far that your feet are now bleeding. And therefore, we want to hear your message again. That's a a true story. It's an amazing story of how God loves to use weakness and suffering rather than strength and power to commend his gospel and to point people towards a suffering savior. And therefore, when we feel weak, when we feel unimpressive, We needn't worry. We we needn't be discouraged. You see, Jesus' mission is deliberately advanced through limping. It's advanced through weak believers carrying on amidst all kinds of challenges and difficulties. We, we, We began with that question, how are we to live in a world that doesn't share our assumptions? And I think it's very easy just to feel discouraged and to give up. And yet it's worth having some perspective on this. Uh, The Roman culture in which the gospel first took root was actually far more foreign, far more alien to a biblical worldview than our culture is. I don't know if you know this, but in the the first couple of centuries, Christianity was was always perceived as immoral and dangerous, you know, eating the body and blood of their God and calling each other brother and sister, even when they're married. You know, everyone thought this sect was highly questionable, not to mention the fact that their chief, their, their creed said Jesus is Lord, and that was heard as a, a direct threat to Caesar and the empire, so they, they were a threat to the whole social order. And the early Christians were not thrown by this, because they understood what we've been seeing today. They understood that Jesus really is committed to those who are far off. No one's out of his reach. They understood that uh, the challenges might be different, that the language might be different, but the welcome is for all. And they understood this final point, that Jesus' mission is advanced through limping. Uh, They weren't impressive. They just kept going through the challenges. And the the Lord used them to, to reach an empire. So let's not be discouraged. Let's recognize that actually the Lord has given us everything we need to do this mission in London. And therefore, his message, uh, not only is it going to be effective, but it is the best possible news. We get to call people to, to, from worshiping vain things that enslave them to a true God who can release them. I, I'm going to leave a bit of quiet for us to um, respond personally to God. And then we'll have our prayers before we share bread and wine together.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that was preached today. We thank you for your commitment to us, the spreading of the good news to the ends of the earth. The good news that liberates us from false idols and brings us back to the true and living God that satisfies. Thank you for the reminder that although there are many nations, religions, and cultures on this earth, yet the invitation to all is the same, and everyone, including us, are in need of your grace and a saviour through Christ Jesus. Help us not be ashamed of the gospel, as it is the power of God that brings everyone who believes, but be bold in proclaiming them to our neighbours near and far. And yes, there will be times when there will be persecution, which may come in many forms, mocking, rejection from friends and families, needing to escape from our homes or countries, physical threats or even death. And these are scary things, Father, but yet we thank you for the assurance that your mission cannot be stopped by human means and that your plans are certain and you are sovereign over all. So help us to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily depending wholly on your grace and the Holy Spirit that you have given us, equipping us as we boldly proclaim your name wherever you have placed us, Father. And so today we pray for our brothers and sisters who are currently being persecuted for their faith in various countries. And today we would like to pray for two of our brothers, Roger and Rocky, and who have been facing charges including blasphemy following the anti-Christian riots that has devastated churches and homes of more than 100 believers uh, in Pakistan. And we thank you that they have successfully been freed from these charges. And we pray for their physical, emotional, and spiritual recovery from their arrest and detention ordeal. And we also pray for the families affected by these riots, that you would comfort them and grant them protection and rest. And you would strengthen their faith in you amidst these difficult times. And as we look closer to home, we commit the upcoming Skeptics Guide in May unto your hands. We thank you that we have a congregation filled with people, blessed with various skills and a passion to serve you. Help us in the planning and logistics of these events that it will run smoothly and that many people will come and inquire regarding our faith. And we pray for the speakers that they may proclaim your gospel clearly and that you soften the hearts of the listeners and draw them to you, leaving them with a desire to come to know the hope that only you can bring. And lastly, we thank you for our recent vision evening. We were reminded again of your wonderful providence for Grace Church Greenwich throughout the years. That even through challenging times and when things don't seem to go our way, you remind us that you are a faithful God and you can turn our hopelessness into blessings for your glory. And may you continue to strengthen our church by your word and spirit and use us as